Welcome to a CME podcast episode from NEI, the Neuroscience Education Institute, hosted by Dr. Andrew Cutler. For complete CME information, please refer to this podcast's description page or go to nei.global slash podcast. Hello and welcome to another NEI podcast, and this is a CME podcast, and we're going to be talking about addressing residual symptoms in MDD, and with me is a good friend and probably no one better to talk with this about than Dr. Vlad Malatik. Vlad, how are you? I'm great, Andy. Uh, so, so good to join you and uh, participate in this very intriguing conversation. I agree. And you know, Vlad, this is actually part two we did a podcast on MDD about a year or so ago that was uh, really fun. And you might remember at the end, we really enjoyed it so much. I think we talked about doing another one. So here we are. We're back again. And uh, it is one of our actually highest rated podcasts. So let's see if we can top ourselves. So, what? Vlad, let's start out with something basic here. Why are residual symptoms important? Let's say a patient is better and they're HAMD score is under seven, so they're in remission. Why should I worry about residual symptoms? Well, there are many reasons, Andy. Uh, one of those is they interfere with the quality of life. So having these residual mm -hmm. symptoms uh, can translate into a silent suffering for our patients on many occasions. The other is yeah. that they can uh, interfere with occupational functioning. There are studies that, that support mm -hmm. that. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, having occupational functioning translates into a uh, much higher uh, likelihood of relapse. Having a residual symptoms yeah. period, as you, as you know, not only shortens the period to relapse, but increases the risk of relapse roughly threefold. So there are many, many uh, good reasons why we should be cognizant of residual symptoms and try to address them in some way. Yeah, I agree. And... You know, residual symptoms can also predict the risk of relapse and uh, other complications. Um, we know that, of course, the goal is always remission. We know response people have worse outcomes than remission. But an interesting study you, I'm sure you're familiar with by our friend Mark Zimmerman took a group of patients with depression whose HAMD scores were seven or less, so symptomatically considered in remission. And interestingly, only half of them rated themselves as in remission. So there is a little bit of a disconnect here. Let's talk a little bit about what are the most common residual symptoms in patients with MDD with our standard treatments. Right. So we can look at residual symptoms uh, that are present in individuals who are technically responders. So they yes. have had a 50% reduction in their depression score on standardized scale, and there are still symptoms left behind. Uh, in terms of what are those likely to be, uh, most likely insomnia. So observed in 80, more than 80% of the individuals with MDD who are partial or who are responders. Interesting. Uh, difficulty with concentration. Uh, over 70% of responders has still difficulty with concentration. A similar number had problems uh, uh, with fatigue, and slightly more than 60% actually had problems with restlessness, uh, which okay. is kind of an intriguing uh, residual symptom because it's uh, often neglected. But, mm -hmm. uh, Andy, we have spoken in the past about anhedonia having yes. high associa association with suicide risk. Restlessness also has very high association with suicide risk. Yes, and, yes, and therefore, you're right. It's, it's best not to ignore it. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because akathisia is associated with suicide risk, and that is another form of restlessness. It's very uncomfortable to be restless. In, indeed, indeed. And then you mentioned it's something that is very sim uh, that's very interesting. Not only responders, but also remitters. Uh, yes. Residual symptoms. And there are studies that have looked into it. So uh, over 40% of remitters uh, will still have cognitive issues. Uh, more than a third will show a lack of energy, and about 40% mm. will have problems with sleep. Now, the part wow. that is really intriguing and kind of builds on the story that, that you mentioned, uh, Andy, uh, there is a study which is uh, a sub-analysis from STAR-D, mm -hmm. and uh, they have looked at patients who are all in remission, but mm -hmm. uh, some of them have had return to normal in terms of their social and occupational function. Uh, others mm -hmm. 
were in symptomatic remission, but their social and occupational functioning was not fully restored. Uh, the ones uh, who had remission, but without normalization of their social and occupational functioning, had twice the rate of recurrence within a 12-month period. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I think you're making an excellent, excellent point, uh, Andy. Yes, we should be focused on symptoms, but I think we should be also focused on uh, restoring functioning, especially in those yes. two major domains, right? Yes. Now, you know, Vlad and I have talked about, Vlad, you and I have talked about this before. Not all symptoms are created equal. Some symptoms have a higher correlation with functional impairment than others. So which ones might they be? So in, in terms of the symptoms that will interfere with functioning, uh, uh, there are no great surprises. <laughs> so uh, uh, having problems with sleep is very problematic from the fun functional yes. perspective. Right. Uh, in addition to that, having cognitive mm -hmm. problems and anhedonia, low yes. motivational state, fatigues, uh, fatigue, yeah. all, all of those yeah. that to interfere with functioning. Absolutely. I sometimes say, Vlad, of the nine potential symptoms of a major depressive episode, if I could only pick two, really cognitive impairment and anhedonia have actually the strongest correlation. Although, as you're right, those that group of them all are. So it seems like with our standard antidepressants, we can often address mood and, and some of the symptoms. But, you know, SSRIs and SNRIs, not so hot at treating these symptoms we've been talking about. Not so good for sleep, concentration, anhedonia, fatigue. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I think that is a, a relative weakness of uh, serotonin and norepinephrine hmm. modulating, especially yeah. uptake inhibitors, right? I, I don't want to generalize this. Yes. Monoamino oxidase inhibitors, yes. because they also modulate serotonin yes. and norepinephrine. But when it comes to serotonin and so, norepinephrine yeah. uh, uptake inhibitors, I think these are, yes. are their weak spots. Well, let's talk mechanistically, especially SSRIs. Why wouldn't SSRIs work for these symptoms mechanistically? So, Andy, it's, it's a very controversial question, and I, I can't say that we have all the answers, but... Uh, here is mm -hmm. speculatively what, what we believe, right? Uh, there, sure. there are studies that uh, look at the impact of serotonin on two major brain networks. One is central mm -hmm. executive network, and the other mm -hmm. one is sensory motor network. And uh, the, the outcome is that uh, when it comes to sensory motor network, uh, SSRIs interfere with our sensory experience. So uh, mm -hmm. our sensory experience is somewhat blunted. And our patients on SSRIs, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you've had those reports, saying that they, they don't uh, have as vivid experience of life. It's uh, yeah. not on, on SSRIs. Yeah. They will sometimes report that uh, they're a little bit slowed down. I've, I've had yeah, patients, they feel blunt, blunted, don't they? They too? feel blunted, blunted and yeah. they feel emotionally yeah. blunted too. Yeah. So uh, no. in increase in serotonin uh, from brainstem on can interfere with dopamine transmission. Uh, so it, it can, uh, exactly. you know, yeah. uh, either in absolute or relative terms, reduce uh, dopamine transmission. And we believe that may be a right. part source uh, for, some, for anhedonia, but possibly also for uh, uh, cognitive slowing and psychological yes. slowing. Well, we know that dopamine's important for pleasure, motivation, reward, and concentration. After all, we treat ADHD with stimulants to try to raise dopamine to improve attention and concentration. So that certainly makes sense. So maybe we need medicines with different mechanisms of action. And certainly we have a number on the market already. Perfect. So, um, So for these residual symptoms, it might be a good idea to consider a different kind of medication. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, ideally, uh, if we're if we're working with monoamines, right? Uh, there are non-monoamine treatments, and that's a different story. Right. But if we're working with uh, monoamines, uh, at least a balanced impact on serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, and mm -hmm. uh, not excessive serotoninergic transmission, which may then interfere with dopamine transmission. Uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there are. You, you know that there are a few agents that are like that. Yeah. Well, you know, we're going to talk more about treatment in a minute. I think uh, 
let's continue with, with sort of defining the problem and talking about the impact here. Mm-hmm. Are there risk factors for developing residual symptoms? And is there a relationship between the severity of the pre- depression and residual symptoms such as emotional blunting? Uh, you know, the answer appears to be yes. So mm-hmm. uh, more severely depressed patients uh, have more emotional blunting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, that is uh, an intriguing concept uh, because uh, there are imaging studies showing that more severe depression is also associated with more psychomotor retardation. Oh, wow. And, and that, that is the relationship, Andy, that uh, I would be interested in, in hearing your thoughts. Uh, that is, in my mind, intriguing. Um, when Sorry. are we looking at emotional blunting versus psychomotor mm-hmm. retardation? Right. Right? Well, because there's certainly these, a connection. These may be yeah. partially overlapping categories. So let's, let's yes. say, you know, let's define this. If we say, we're talking about, about, about emotional blunting, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, the assumption is that these are patients who will have not only positive emotions blunted, which is also the case in individuals who have anhedonia, but they will also have their negative emotions blunted. I now, see. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, if there's severe depression, there will be more of that blunting. But uh, the imaging study that I referenced is that uh, psychomotor retardation, especially uh, severe psychomotor retardation, is, has very strong association with depression severity. Yes, and these would be individuals who will have uh, less uh, uh, a response to sensory cues, will have mm-hmm. uh, what appears to be lower energy and lower motoric activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's, what's driving that? Is that low motivation? In which case it can be associated with both with emotional blunting and with anhedonia. What mm-hmm. is behind it and how do these phenomena relate to each other? I think that's still an open question. It is fascinating. I want to highlight something you just mentioned, Vlad, that is confusing, I think, for clinicians, and that is the difference between anhedonia and emotional blunting. Now, they share some characteristics of a decrease of emotional experience, but what is the difference? Well, the difference is not on the positive end. So I they, they both have decreased uh, uh, reward signaling, which le- translates into less interest less motivation, less mm-hmm. ability to enjoy life. But mm-hmm. when it comes to negative emotions, uh, they are opposite of each other. Mm-hmm. So in anhedonia, we very often see increased negative emotions. So somebody right. is not interested and unable to enjoy life, but in addition to that, they are maybe irritable and angry and depressed mm-hmm. and anxious. Mm-hmm. Uh, if mm-hmm. they have emotional blunting, it's not only mm-hmm. positive emotions that are reduced, but also negative yes. I see. Now, can they both be seen in depressed patients and as a side effect of treatment? Which is more likely to be caused by the treatment, let's say? You know, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, we believe that emotional blunting is more commonly associated uh, with treatment. Although yes. both can be the case, right? Yes. So yes. Uh, agents that boost serotonin are more likely to reduce both positive and negative emotions. But we have also seen that in patients who have very severe depression, we have yes. other more emotional blunting. So in the end, when we use these medicines, and if our patients are getting better, and there are residual symptoms that are remindful emotional blunting, we're left with this dilemma. Is this yes. a residual symptom that was there in the beginning? Or is it... Uh, Maybe that patient has responded, but because we're using serotoninergic agent, in the end, they're still left with some emotional blunting. Um, Clinical studies do inform us partially, and Mm -hmm. uh, if we are able to bring patients closer to remission, some of the emotional blunting uh, seems to improve. Uh, But uh, that is obviously not the case in all our patients. You know, you're right, Vlad. I think we've all had the experience of a severely depressed patient who says, I just feel numb. I, I just don't feel, I, the word numb is sometimes used, you know, I don't really feel yeah. anything. And that's obviously blunting. Yep. But then we've had the experience of someone with low pleasure, not able to enjoy things, low motivation, but they can still tell you how depressed and anxious, as you mentioned, yes. they are. Yes. So that's a really well, helpful, yes. very helpful. All right. Um, how do we know if 
this, what we're seeing with a patient we're treating is a residual symptom of depression or a side effect of the medication. And I realize you can't always, it's an overlap. It's hard to tell. <laughs> it is very hard to tell, Andy. I, I think that the best way uh, would be to pay attention at what is going on in the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a good idea if we can map our patient symptoms, right? Yes. So at the onset, we're seeing them in, in our office. Uh, let, let's inquire about your interest, about your ability to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you and I have spoken about it. And one way of yeah. doing it is maybe identifying some of the behaviors that were commonly pleasurable. So right. these are individuals who in the past, uh, uh, we just spoke to somebody who said, I, I enjoy <laughs> making cookies when I feel good. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, there are patients I've, I've had, uh, a, a female patient who would say, I enjoy playing bridge uh, when I'm yes. feeling well. Uh, yes. There are individuals who in, enjoy doing handiwork or playing golf. So sure. one, one way of inquiring is saying, okay, tell me about three activities in which yeah. you engage before you became depressed. And since yeah. becoming depressed, uh, either f uh, frequency of engaging in these behaviors uh, has been reduced or you find them to be much less enjoyable. Right. And then we can use these as benchmarks and as right. Our treatment progresses. Uh, we right. can see if there is improvement. Right. That, of course, is in positive symptoms, but also when it comes to negative symptoms. Right, right. How intense is, in, is depression? How anxious are our patients? Is there irritability and agitation? And how does right. that change in the course of treatment? Obviously, right. if the patient did not have uh, much emotional blunting at the onset of treatment, and we find it to be the case when most of the other symptoms have resolved, uh, then uh, we, we can rightfully blame the medicine. It's the medicine yeah. that caused it. I think you're right. I mean, the key is really getting a good pretreatment history and having that accurate baseline so that you can track things. Now, speaking of tracking, Vlad, there's a number of rating scales. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the rating scales clinicians can use to track residual symptoms? Well, you know, so, some of the scales that uh, that I would suggest and that are readily accessible, and, and please add, Andy, I know you have rich yeah. clinical experience, yeah. but yes. uh, uh, PHQ-9 is readily yes. available. It does inquire about many of the symptoms. Um, uh, you know, a uh, quick inventory of depressive symptoms is also an easy download, and it's uh, uh, free and available to clinicians. And that uh, also does provide... Yes. Yes. some summary review of, of all the symptoms. Uh, in addition to that, there are some scales. I, I, I know you're aware of those, especially you mentioned on Hedonia. So uh, there mm -hmm. is Nate Hamilton, uh, uh, mm -hmm. pleasure scales, uh, SHAPS uh, for mm -hmm. short. Uh, the Snaith Hamilton, yeah. Yeah, Snaith Hamilton mm -hmm. uh, 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 scale, uh, which, I, uh, you know, frankly, I'm not quite uh, sure about their legal status, and therefore I don't want to get our audience in trouble. <laughs> it can be yes. downloaded from the it can for it free, can. right? Yes. As opposed yes. to DARS, which is more dimensional yes. anhedonia right. rating scale, which is That's very true. difficult to obtain, and I imagine what yes. one would uh, uh, need to reimburse the makers yes. of the scale in order to use it. So these are just some of the scales that uh, that may be a consideration. Uh, Madras right. is uh, often used in trials. I don't know how many mm -hmm. clinicians routinely use Madras, but yes. Madras has uh, five items uh, which mm -hmm. constitute so-called anhedonia subscale. And right, out of the 10, yeah. Out of the 10, 10 it's, it's yeah. both uh, uh, reported in an observed uh, uh, depression. Yes. In addition yes. to that, concentration, difficulty, lassitude, passivity, and, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, emotional numbing, those are some of the mm -hmm. items that compose yes. that scale. Yeah, I agree. Those are great, Fernando. Of course, the quids was the scale used in the uh, STAR-D study mm -hmm. and quick inventory depressive symptoms. The PHQ-9, a lot of people are using this because it's embedded in medical records, and it's simply the nine potential symptoms of depression from the DSM. Uh, which is fine. And, you know, there is one on inhedonia. There's one on concentration cognition. Um, I think probably what would be good for people is to use uh, self-report scales are easier. And there's a couple we didn't mention yet. One is the good old-fashioned Beck Depression Inventory, the BDI. Right. Been around for a while and also has 
questions on concentration and things like that. And then there's one that we tend to use in research settings, but you know, Vlad, it, it really does lend itself to clinical practice. It's not that complicated. And it's called the Mass General Hospital CPFQ, Cognitive and Physical Functioning Questionnaire, which really focuses on cognition and energy and motivation and things like that. And we've already said those are really some of the key residual symptoms. So uh, those, those three uh, sort of stand out. Uh, okay, Vlad, so now we've talked about this. Now let's talk about treatment. Let's start out with the patient. How do we involve our patients in treatment, in the treatment, in the decision making? How do we do that? How do we engage them? You know, Andy, uh, some of the conversation that you and I have had, uh, mm -hmm. I don't mind having that conversation with the patient. Ah. Including, including admitting that sometimes it's hard to sort out what is residual symptom of their depression versus side effect of the medicine. Yeah. And, and this is really important because uh, uh, our approaches can be a little bit different, right? If, mm -hmm. if this is a residual symptom, maybe the problem is efficacy of the agent. But on right. the other hand, if this is a, an adverse reaction or a side effect, yes. uh, such as emotional blunting, then we yes. need to think about medicines that are less likely to be associated with emotional blunting. Yes. And, and there, there are possibilities now, of course. Uh, Certainly are. Spoken about. So what you're saying is involve the patient in some of the uncertainty, but also here are some of our options that we could try options. to resolve. Here are the pluses this. and minuses, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here is what kind of uh, efficacy we can anticipate from this medicine. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. thinking about your symptoms, that this is why we think medicines A, B, and C may be mm -hmm. appropriate choice for you. But on the other yeah. hand, these are some adverse reactions that you yeah. might experience. And, and well, allow, some, allow, mm -hmm. allow patient to make an informed uh, decision. Well, something else we've uh, discussed I think is critical, and that is taking a careful history and demonstrating interest in the patient. You know, when I was doing my uh, internal medicine residency concurrent with psychiatry, I'll never forget my first day of medical internship. We were all given a, a pamphlet written by a famous physician named Francis Weld Peabody. And I'll never forget the quote on the first page of this pamphlet. It was talking about how to care for patients. And it said, the secret to care for the patient is to care about the patient. <laughs> and I think you, right? Isn't that great? That is the essence, right? It is the essence. So you demonstrate that by curiosity, and you've already said this, really asking questions about the specific hobbies and interests and relationships, understanding their particular life. Because let's face it, not every patient has every symptom, and some of the symptoms are generic unless you personalize them. And I think step one is to engage the patient and demonstrate interest and understand them as an individual. And then it is easier to involve them in treatment decisions. As you've mentioned, for instance, are you cooking? Are you trying new recipes? Are you playing golf? Are you going out and having lunch with friends? Whatever it is here in Florida, and I assume where you are in South Carolina, fishing is a uh, pastime some people do, whatever it is. And so then I think you get better outcomes because you, first of all, have more specific things to track, but also you've demonstrated interest and the patient's more likely, I think, to share things with you. We're all like that. If someone demonstrates interest, I'm going to tell them more, you know, than if they're just doing a checklist of questions. And, and Andy, as you know, talking about history, they are very important uh, parts of history. So yeah. one is uh, determining if the patients have had early life trauma. Oh, that's really good. Right. That is something that our patients are, are not likely to spontaneously report because those yes. memories are often very painful. Yet, yet yes. having trauma may be associated with anhedonia and a lot of residual yes. symptoms because they yes. tend not to respond to pharmacotherapy as well. And addition, Well, to certain pharmacotherapies, right? right? SSRIs and SNRIs. Definitely. And in yeah. addition, uh, there are studies that have established that addition of uh, uh, types of cognitive behavioral therapy may yeah. boost response and remission rates. And then wow. one that is amazingly uh, uh, often neglected so uh, here, here is a study that honestly changed uh, how I practiced medicine. Mm. So uh, this is a study that uh, uh, took predominantly female population mm -hmm. uh, who had similar uh, depression severity scores at the onset of the study. Mm -hmm. And then for a number of weeks, uh, my memory is maybe eight weeks, uh, they were treated with antidepressants, several different antidepressants were utilized. Right. 
Uh, in addition uh, to uh, using depression severity scale, uh, they also used marital adjustment scale. Oh, my. To see uh, what is their dyadic functioning like. And then they made mm -hmm. comparisons uh, between uh, the bottom third who had the greatest uh, marital issues and the top third who had the fewest marital issues. Obviously, individuals who had fewest uh, uh, marital issues had double response and remission rates. Wow. So, so, so here, here's the outcome. We're seeing the medicine is not working. Well, <laughs> antidepressants sometimes work for depression, but antidepressants mm -hmm. are not known to fix bad marriages. And, <laughs> yes. and not understanding the context can t sometimes yes. take us down the wrong path. So what well, you're Vlad, saying you know, is understand yeah. the context. I think that is yes. a really important message. Well, I think the two things here that come out of this, because they can really affect treatment, are getting a history of early life adversity or early life trauma, and understanding people's relationships. And I would argue it's not just marital relationships. There are people who have long-term relationships that are not married, um, mm -hmm. significant relationships. That, that's so helpful. And then I want to go back to something else you said, Vlad, that's really helpful. I know a lot of clinicians are a little bit reluctant to use rating scales, and you and I are fans of measurement-based care. But how about creating your own rating scale? It's individualized for the patient. Ask them the three things that bother them the most about this depression or the three things that they uh, are not doing that they previously did. However you want to do that. And then you just simply write it in the chart and every visit you ask about those three things. You know, it could be symptoms. It could be uh, things you're not, you know, quality of life or function. But then you've created an individualized rating scale, if you will, for the, that particular patient. Yeah, people may not realize, but that's a rating scale. That's measurement-based care. Absolutely. And, you know, when it comes to sleep problems and intensity of depressed sure. mood, intensity sure. of anxiety and energy, say on a scale from one to 10, uh, you know, 10 being the, the worst or the best, one being mm -hmm. the opposite, mm -hmm. where are yeah. you right now? And then yeah. revisiting these most troublesome symptoms uh, with, yes. every treatment, uh, with every appointment. Yes. Okay. Well, we've hinted around this. I want to have a conversation with you about, let's say you're treating a patient with an SSRI, which is often our first line, and they're having residual symptoms. What are the options here? Um, obviously, there's switch and augment are the, the obvious sort of choices. Do we have data on any antidepressants that might be good ideas to switch to or augment with? Uh, Andy, we have, we have uh, very good data. In, 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 yeah. in terms of the general philosophy, right, if, mm -hmm. if the patient has had uh, some response, but they're not responders, mm -hmm. they've improved more than mm -hmm. 25%, but uh, not yes. more than 49%, right? They're 25 yes. to 50. Uh, philosophy there is uh, keep what you have and build on it. If they yes. have less than 25%, then it's a switch. If they have intolerable yes. adverse reactions, mm -hmm. switch. Yes, so, yes. What, what are some of the options, right? Uh, interestingly, you've mentioned anhedonia. Uh, mm -hmm. We've not spoken specifically, but uh, sexual side effects are, are very concerning. Emotional blood Absolutely. Are concerning. Uh, there are data, yes. for example, with vortioxetine. Uh, it is a multi yes. serotonin modulating medication, which based on preclinical right. study, uh, studies also have, uh, a, 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 it has ability uh, to increase indirectly uh, dopamine and histamine and acetylcholine. Well, uh, this yes. medication uh, has, at least in the studies, been re uh, associated with uh, a reduction of uh, sexual side effects relative to SSRIs and SNRIs. It has been associated yes. with improvement in emotional bunting, and it has been yes. associated with improvement in cognition as measured yes. by uh, of something that is called digit symbol substitution scale. So there are yes. medicines that can, that can help with yes. the symptom domain, right? Uh, well, it's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a fan of receptors. Uh, we talked about there's reuptake inhibitors, but mm -hmm. also there's other things that affect receptors. And one of the things we augment with would be an atypical antipsychotic, which is obviously binding to receptors. Mm -hmm. But vortioxetine almost has built-in augmentation. It has some SRI activity but it binds to five serotonin receptors. And mm -hmm. let's face it, serotonin receptors 
modify and do things other than just serotonin, as you've mentioned, dopamine and glutamate and, and histamine. And it's very interesting that the data on switching to vortioxetine, as we mentioned, is quite strong for sexual side effects. Uh, there, was, there was a study of patients who were taking SSRIs. Their depression was well treated, but they had sexual side effects. And switching to vortioxetine did not destabilize their depression, but it did improve sexual function. There are data, as you said, on cognition. As a matter of fact, the package insert was modified. It, it is now approved to treat um, uh, not all cognition, of course, but uh, pro delayed processing speed, if you will. Mm -hmm. So that's cognition. And also, uh, there are good data. You know, our friend Roger McIntyre has published on anhedonia with vortioxetine. And emotional so, blunting, too. Yeah. And emotional blunting. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Now, of course, there are data, as we've talked about, on anhedonia with some of the other options. Uh, there are some data on adding cariprazine to uh, SSRIs. There are some data on ketamine and S-ketamine for anhedonia. And then we have data on the newest antidepressant, the combination of uh, dextromethorphan and bupropion. Indeed. And, you know, an agent, now this is, uh, this is on the near horizon, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. It is an agent that is approved in Asia, but uh, not yet uh, in European Union. And it is currently mm -hmm. being reviewed by FDA. And mm -hmm. uh, this agent is called ansofaxine. Uh, ah. it, is, uh, it is a spinoff on venlafaxine molecule, uh -huh. uh, but it, interestingly enough, it is norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine uptake inhibitor. Ah, triple reuptake inhibitor. Triple yeah. uptake inhibitor. And yeah. they do have data uh, about improvement uh, in anhedonia as well as in anxiety. Uh, yes. Another agent that is unfortunately not in U.S. Uh, yes, yes that will uh, be an agonist of melatonin receptors. Yes, Serotonin yes. Serotonin antagonist, uh, agomelatine. Also agomelatine. Has, mm -hmm. Right, also has that on improvement in anhedonia. Premipexone. It's also, a, it's also a serotonin 5-HT2C antagonist. Serotonin and you know, Vlad, I did, I, I did the studies. We tried to get it approved in the U.S., and I had some patients do very well with agomelatine. Yes. But, uh, oh, well. And, and then, sorry, and, you were saying... Well, the 2C two, two antagonism, uh, yeah. at least theoretically and in preclinical mm -hmm. studies, 2C uh, mm -hmm. present to GABA interneurons in, in ventral mm -hmm. ventral area uh, activates mm -hmm. GABA inhibits dopamine release, therefore yes. blocking serotonin 2C yeah. uh, may increased. be associated with the increase in dopaminergic transmission. And I yes. mentioned uh, Premipex, you may Premipex. mentioned Riprazine, which has yes. data on, on uh, improvement in anhedonia. Um, mm -hmm. Premipexol is also dopamine, dopamine 2, dopamine 3 partial agonist. As a matter yes. of fact, affinity and intrinsic activity of premipexol is very similar to gariprazine. And it that, I didn't know that one. Very, very similar. Yeah. It's about 70% yeah. intrinsic activity. And uh, it has been used in major depressive mm -hmm. disorder and, and yes. has data of improvement uh, in yes. anhedonia. Now, you mentioned 5-HT2C antagonism. And Vlad, you know, uh, I did my training on dopamine receptors, and you're one of the world's authorities on norepinephrine receptors. Uh, between the two of us, we could talk about receptors for a long time, but there is one other one I want to mention, and that's 5-HT1A. Agonism of 5-HT1A can also influence dopamine and is beneficial for cognition. Yeah, that is absolutely right. Uh, I had a chance to uh, speak with the team that was involved in uh, uh, developing uh, vortioxetine. So uh, th oh, there's a theory yeah. that serotonin-3 antagonism is central right. uh, to improvement right. in, in anhedonia. Uh, they had very strong feelings that serotonin-1A agonism was actually yes. um, of major influence. And preclinical... Yeah, models. they're both, both good. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah, I've, I've spoken with them as well, and the goal was really to develop an SRI, SRI with 5-HT3 antagonism and 5-HT1A agonism, and the rest of it came along for the ride. They, uh, actually, actually, they told me that they got a little lucky, and that's okay. Sometimes yeah. you want to be lucky rather than good. <laughs> right. Okay, yes. All right, let's, you, you mentioned sexual dysfunction. This is a big issue, and it's one of those ones that's a little confusing. Is it being caused by the illness or by the medication? Let's assume it is a side effect of the medicine. What are some strategies to deal with that? So one of the strategies that has been utilized for a long time uh, would be addition of bupropion. So yes. addition of bupropion, again, it is uh, 
uh, relatively modest uh, norepinephrine dopamine mm-hmm. reuptake inhibiting agent. But it's a very reasonable strategy. It's a reasonable strategy, and it does require higher uh, doses, uh, mm-hmm. higher than 300 milligrams. In many studies, 450 milligrams. So that is a strategy, interestingly enough, that can not only improve uh, sexual functioning uh, in some instances, but may also mm-hmm. help with cognition. Um, in, in terms of the uh, uh, cognitive batteries, looking at cognition, bupropion is one of those that actually does have evidence of improvement in cognition, and there's even some evidence of improvement in anhedonia. So, well, it, that is it, interesting. Yeah, so it might it might serve uh, multiple purposes. Of course, as, as you know, uh, we have covered this topic in, in one of, pro, of previous CME programs that you and I did. I believe it yes. was for Asian market. Uh, that uh, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, anhedonia and sexual uh, uh, dysfunction have very strong uh, relationship with each other. Yes, that is certainly true. I mean, sexual uh, sex sexual function is a form of pleasure, of course, yep. if yep. you will, and you, you need motivation, of course. Yeah, so that makes sense. Well. Which, uh, speaking of this, so we've talked a little bit about, of, of course, you know, one strategy for sexual dysfunction is to add, augment, another would be to switch. Which right. antidepressants have lower rates of sexual dysfunction? Uh, looking at some of the agents, uh, uh, meta-analysis, uh, of course, will all show that bupropion has very low uh, incidence. Uh, uh, mirtazapine is one of the agents that has a lower uh, yeah. uh, rate of, of sexual dysfunction. And vortioxetine mm-hmm. also has a lower rate mm-hmm. of sexual dysfunction. Mm-hmm. Velazodone has a lower ra- uh, rate of sexual yes. dysfunction. Yes. So these are some of the, the options that, that come to mind. So vortioxetine and velazodone, is it thought that it's the 5-HT1A, I would think, that's uh, helping one, that? Yeah, that is, that is, that is the, the thought, right? Yeah. And then uh, you also mentioned... Uh, 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 a novel agent that is uh, uh, NMDA modulating medicine, and it mm-hmm. is a combi- combination between dextrometorphan and bupropion, mm-hmm. and uh, right. it, it seems to have a, a relatively low rate of, of sexual adverse reactions. And uh, uh, you know, talking about those, the other medicine that uh, doesn't seem to have consistent impact. Of course, this is for treatment resistant depression, but mm-hmm. esketamine, uh, right. As right. not to have any kind of uh, enduring uh, uh, right. sexual side effects. So essentially, most of the antidepressants, other than SSRIs and SNRIs, because those are the main offenders, it sounds like. Right, they could be in play, and and uh, s- same is the case. Uh, we didn't mention it in terms of uh, uh, addressing sexual adverse reactions, but agomelatine does not have yes. significant sexual yes. dysfunction either. Yeah, not being a strong uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, I guess, is helpful in that regard. Indeed. Now, we've talked a little bit about cognitive function. So we're talking about residual symptoms here. Let's move on to cognitive uh, function. Um, Most antidepressants are not good, and some actually can worsen cognitive function, right? So in, in meta-analysis, it's it's really interesting. Bupropion was okay. not, so bupropion had a different uh, body of evidence supporting its improvement. Right. You're talking about the Bernhard Bohm uh, meta-analysis? Uh, in that meta-analysis, bupropion yeah. was not involved. Yes, but right. But all SSRIs and SNRIs were yes. associated with degree of impairment uh, in cognition as measured by digit symbol substitution test. Uh, which uh, you, you have correctly identified, right? With, with the exception of duloxetine had a small signal, I believe. It was small signal, indeed, small signal. Yeah. But it's it's mainly processing speed, although there yeah. are psychologists who argue that in order to perform on digit symbol substitution test, one needs to have a pretty good working memory in addition to Yeah, that, yeah. Right? Well, I agree. I think the DSST is more than just uh, speed of yeah, processing, processing and correct, correct. mechanical. Um, you know, as, of course, some of our older ones, tricyclics, of course, can worsen because they have anticholinergic effects. So, uh, and in that analysis, vortioxetine came out really way ahead of the others for cognition. That one is the only one that's statistically separated. From yeah. That. That is now, this, of course, did not include our newest ones. There's some evidence that ketamine and esketamine might be beneficial for cognition. There's the dextromethorphan bupropion combo that we talked about, which does have bupropion in it. Yes. And, you know, we would need to see better data. Uh, I yeah. think what we can say clearly 
uh, with uh, S-ketamine, uh, there seems to be some cognitive impairment in the first two hours. Yes. Uh, after yes. two hours, it's no longer recognizable. Uh, yes. Next day, even using uh, good cognitive batteries, there is no difference between uh, S-ketamine and placebo. Uh, they do have data uh, extending to several years uh, mm -hmm. where there doesn't see seem to be a cognitive impairment. Uh, it would be good to actually see some measures mm -hmm. of improvement in cognition. Yes. This is something yes. that we would anticipate uh, given the mechanism of action and right. improvement in glutamate transmission, but we yes. could use a little bit more evidence there. Well, Vlad, I, I can actually tell you from my personal experience being involved in the clinical trials with intranasal S-ketamine, I had patients telling me they felt more clear-headed mm -hmm. and their memory seemed a little better. So, you know, <laughs> that's my subjective experience. Please don't hang your hat on it. It is not controlled data, <laughs> which is what we need. But uh, that's something, you know, and you know, clinicians, we get a feel for a medicine, don't we? Sometimes you just get a feel of a medicine and it may not be reflected in the data. Right. Yeah, man, as you say, uh, uh, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that expression. I love that. Yes. So because it's okay, so, not yes. been done, it doesn't mean that it doesn't help with the clinician. Yes. So we've talked about some antidepressants with data for cognition for anhedonia. Uh, other residual symptoms uh, could include emotional blunting and fatigue. Um, and then I want to get to sleep after that. So let's talk a little bit about emotional blunting and fatigue first. Uh, uh, again, there are vortioxidine studies that uh, uh, demonstrate that it yeah. is in, in, uh, there's improvement in emotional blunting. And interestingly, when it comes to fatigue, uh, mm -hmm. There are data about SSRIs and there are data about noradrenergic agents. And here mm -hmm. is uh, how uh, uh, how these uh, studies uh, uh, demonstrate the impact. So uh, in STAR-D, they looked at individuals who had uh, the highest scores on uh, energy fatigue scales, so, so diminished energy and fatigue. Uh, so the ones who had the high score versus the lowest score the difference uh, in remission rate is double. In other words, wow. SSRIs did not work for people with severe fatigue. Wow, wow. But when it comes to agents that do have some benefit, uh, another noradrenergic agent, not available here, raboxetine does show yes. improvement in, in energy yes. levels. Bupropion does show improvement in energy levels. Yes. So, uh, there are even some SNRIs that show uh, improvement over SSRIs when it comes to yes. Well, there is a gradient, isn't there, with the SNRIs as far as how much norepinephrine reuptake inhibition. They're not all the same. And so no. obviously more norepinephrine, I would think, would be beneficial. Would be advantageous, correct. Yes, that's, what, that, that's how it appears in the studies. Well, Vlad, let's not forget good old-fashioned stimulants. A great trivia question. I love uh, pimping people with this. What was the first medication FDA approved to treat depression? It turns out in 1939, it was amphetamine, benzodrine. Might it be amphetamine, yeah. That's <laughs> right. I know, it's a big surprise. 20 years before tricyclics and uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but there is a, there's a long literature, actually, of augmentation, I would say, with stimulants to help with some of these residual symptoms, and too. Even used as a probe in the past. So uh, th ah. this is a practice that is no longer current. Uh, but uh, decades ago, stimulants were used to prognosticate improvement with tricyclics in oh patients my. and, and uh, MAYs in patients with melancholy depression. So wow. if they have transient improvement in response to stimulants, odds are yes. that cyclics and MAYs may, may work. That is fascinating. Wow. Okay. Now we've talked also about uh, medications that have lower rates of sexual dysfunction. And we also talked about uh, the possibility of using bupropion in that setting. Uh, do we have data? I, I just want to, you know, the, the FDA approved treatments for augmentation are actually atypical antipsychotics. There's five of them. Uh, olanzapine fluoxetine is actually approved for TRD. The other four are for inadequate response. What are the data on atypical antipsychotic augmentation for treating residual symptoms? So, uh, you, you know, it, it, you, you mentioned several different types of symptoms. So, cateopine yes. is definitely one of the agents that is approved. 
uh, yes. patients with residual anxiety and who have residual sleep problems. That's right. Uh, yes. Would that be your experience? That is that. I think good? that is. Uh, I think in the real world, that is exactly the kind of patients that people use quetiapine for. Uh, Vlad, I presented a poster in the year 2000 at the APA meeting on quetiapine for anxiety. <laughs> and I was trying to advise AstraZeneca to make this the atypical antipsychotic for everything but schizophrenia uh, because of the antidepressant and anti-anxiety effects. And I'm an author on a paper of quetiapine for MDD as monotherapy, believe it or not. So, yeah, it's a, definitely an agent that uh, we use in certain situations, the risk of weight gain, of course. And, and then Bregs Piperzol, uh, they, yes. uh, they do have that about uh, depression uh, where it, it was not defined as such, but effectively... Uh, patients who have depression with anxious distress. And, yes, yes. And, uh, uh, Maurizio Fava and his colleagues from Mass General did a study uh, looking at uh, irritability in depression. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They noted that uh, indeed with uh, uh, Brex Piperzol, there was improvement in irrit irritability. Uh, as you know, there are also positive studies, uh, phase three positive study in PTSD. So that is something that is intriguing as comorbidity. And finally, yes. it is medicine that's approved for treatment of vegetation in uh, patients uh, uh, suffering from dementia. So Yeah, that's uh, the new yeah, approval, right. the new indication. So uh, edu uh, agitation, anxiety, symptoms yes. consistent with hyperarousal, uh, irritability, yes. that may be yes. something that may benefit. And then, well, that's uh, really well, really well I, said. Before we get to the next one, I think yeah. clinicians have started, have thought about Brex Piperzol for those anxious and uh, irritable. I just want to share a quick story. I was in Japan two months ago uh, because they're about to get the approval of Rexulti for MDD, and I was speaking to one of our Japanese colleagues who participated in the Brex Piperzol studies, and he told me exactly this: that that's the kind of patients he saw it do well with. And we even talked about mixed symptoms. So patients with a depressive episode with mixed features, which incorporates a lot of those symptoms, not necessarily bipolar, but so, uh, yeah. And then I, I'm sure you're going to go on next to another one. To cariprazine, right? So, yes, of course. Uh, it, it is to, uh, there, there are data about cariprazine being associated with improvement uh, in anxiety. And uh, yes. uh, uh, you're well aware of the studies uh, uh, that have shown improvement in uh, madras and hedonia subscale. That's uh, right. Possibly associated with dopamine 2, dopamine 3 partial agonism. Again, now Vlad, mm -hmm. now, Vlad, you presented at the NEI Congress last weekend a very fascinating study talking about two different biologic types of depression. And you just made me think that perhaps... Brex Piprazol is for one and Cariprazine is for the other. So please share with us that information. So it is a very large imaging study, and it's a study that uh, I'm rounding off the numbers, had roughly 1,000 individuals with depression and wow. 1,000 individuals uh, uh, who are uh, healthy controls. Well, uh, in this study, there appear to be two uh, global biotypes of depression. Mm -hmm. So uh, one biotype uh, is the so-called overconnected biotype. And what it indicates is that there is more robust uh, uh, association between default uh, mode brain areas and uh, salience network areas, mm -hmm. which translates into prominent mm -hmm. uh, so a tendency to ruminate and mm -hmm. suicidal ideation. Yeah. Uh, this, this group is about uh, 30, 35% of depressed patients. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, they tended to respond well to initial treatment. Ah. The other larger group is 60 plus percent of the patients. And uh, we can think of them as underconnected. Mm -hmm. And it is a lower connection between central executive areas and salience mm -hmm. areas and, and within the reward network. Right. And these are the individuals who have had prominent anhedonia and unfortunately tended not to respond well to initial antidepressant treatment. Right. Of course, initial antidepressant treatment, SSRIs, SNRIs, as you have said uh, several Right, times. not as yeah. good. Not now, as I did uh, tease a minute ago we were going to talk about sleep, and I guess the most important thing is SSRIs and SNRIs don't really help sleep that much and actually can worsen sleep architecture to some degree. And I hate to keep coming back to this, but vortioxetine actually has uh, data. They have actually polysomnography data showing it does improve sleep architecture. And, and then this, we mentioned... This was in healthy individuals, too. 
Health, yeah. even in healthies. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, you mentioned agamelatine, which obviously makes a lot of sense being a melatonin agonist. Uh, we use yeah. melatonin. We mentioned quetiapine as an augmenter. Mertazapine. Um, mertazapine is a terrific one if weight gain is not a significant concern. And then, you know, I, I've been part of some studies in the past using the non-benzodiazepine hypnotic agents, uh, both um, uh, the Z-drug, Zolpidem, and s uh, which both were shown to improve sleep in patients with MDD and insomnia, but also uh, the uh, a more robust overall antidepressant response. And interestingly, Vlad, we have these orexin antagonists for sleep, and there are some, there's very good data now. The orexin system may be involved not only in sleep and arousal, but also depression. And there is one in particular being studied as an augmentation to antidepressants to improve not only sleep, but overall depression. As a junk of treatment, right? As a junk of treatment, yeah. Insomnia. Absolutely. Yeah, so I would encourage, you know, we know that you're not going to get the best outcomes if you don't help sleep. That's pretty well documented. So we probably need to focus on that a little more than we've been doing. Well, Vlad, we're running a little low on time. I want to wrap up a little with talking about, we've talked a lot about medication. Let's talk about some non-pharmacologic approaches to treating residual MDD symptoms. Okay. So uh, what are some non-pharmacologic approaches? Uh, yes. Uh, very robust data with, uh, well, when it comes to treatment-resistant depression, let's not forget, ECT still works. Oh, <laughs> sure. Is, well, neuromodulation. It method, but it still works. And, uh, and TMS uh, should be considered, and of course, VNS in some cases. And yes. VNS, absolutely. Yes. Uh, there, There is a, a form. Uh, it is uh, uh, Stanford Neuromodulatory Treatment. Yes. The SAINT protocol. <laughs> it used to be SAINT. Now they shortened it to SNT. Oh, oh excuse yes. me. Okay, I'm not up it's on okay. that. Yes. The it's, SNT. It's, I like uh, SAINT better, but that's fine. <laughs> it, it's more catchy for sure. Yes, yes. But it, it is a protocol that uh, uh, includes administration of 10 consecutive uh, uh, theta burst TMS treatments in a day. Yes. So yes, uh, aside from the fact that it lasts uh, uh, for literally 10 hours. Uh, yeah. First 10 minutes is treatment, and the remainder of the hour is free, and then treatment, and so on. Yeah. But yeah. it is a five-day treatment that has shown a very good response in treatment-resistant depression. Yes. Uh, in, in general, theta burst in depression seems to be quite effective treatment. Uh, yes. There is evidence, uh, as you know, Andy, that uh, uh, TMS treatment can help with anhedonia. So yes, you know, that's true. Uh, we didn't mention that earlier, Vlad. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, it, There is evidence, indeed. Uh, and then uh, it's uh, it's in intriguing to think that uh, there are psychotherapies. Mm -hmm, so there is exactly. rumination-focused cognitive therapy that seems to work for mm -hmm. rumination. Uh, yes. It's actually considered as, as uh, uh, treatment to be registered in Great Britain. Uh, there oh, wow. is a new form of, of uh, CBD-type intervention uh, mm -hmm. that, that is called BATA. Uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, a be behavioral activation treatment for anhedonia. Oh, my. Uh, where one uh, begins by uh, identifying obstacles. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do people have behavioral avoidance? Uh, setting a realistic treatment plan. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I really like the third component because it's called dabbling. <laughs> Try doing things that you have not done before that <laughs> could be fun. Right, That's good. Dabble and the too. fourth component is immersion in in a yes. pleasurable experience. Uh, yeah, uh, being being fully aware and immersed. Yes. So yeah. yes, there. So I, I would not neglect psychotherapies. Uh, of course, there there is uh, CBTI uh, uh, psychotherapy. I was going to mention that, Vlad. Right. That's actually yeah. the American Academy of Sleep Medicine recommends that as first line treatment for insomnia, even before Absolutely. hypnotics. Absolutely. So certainly true. So CBT certainly. Um, and there are other forms, of course, of psychotherapy. There's interpersonal therapy. There are family therapies, as you mentioned. If there's relationship issues, that might be uh, something to consider. Um, and then, you know, Vlad, we have to mention something, and I'm going to quote you, that our very good friend Roger McIntyre indulges in daily, and you and I contemplate quite frequently, and exercise. that is, of course, exercise. Exercise, first of all, has an antidepressant effect that's pretty well known. We all know that if we exercise regularly, we sleep better and uh, perhaps helps with anhedonia. 
Absolutely. And you know, an, another thing that is that is not uh, as often mentioned, but uh, it's it's a very important factor. It's loneliness. Oh, we we have not mentioned that. Please t- speak more so, about that. So there there are uh, large large studies involving thousands of patients, Andy, and this is what the, what they all looked at. They looked at the functional imaging. They looked at mm-hmm. structural imaging. They looked mm-hmm. at indicators of neuroplasticity. They looked mm-hmm. at inflammatory signaling. Yeah, and the two biggest differentiators between people who are depressed and people who are not depressed. Number one. The history of early life adversity. Number two, having social supports. Oh my goodness! And we know That's that remarkable. loneliness is associated with significant increase in risk for depression. Well, so, this um, circles well, back to like something. That. Yeah. Well, this circles back to something we said earlier, which is to inquire in your history about early life adversity and the quality of relationships. Indeed. Indeed. And this is something that is not. Of course, you're past history is not necessarily modifiable, but your relationships, this is modifiable. And this is something that you can emphasize with your patients. Absolutely. Now, we we talk about, of course, uh, seeking out good relationships, but you know, there's some people who are stuck in toxic relationships. And I would assume, of course, psychotherapy to assist with getting out of those, understanding maybe why you're locked into those uh, would be helpful. And, and, you know, it's uh, definitely couples therapy because you mentioned toxic relationships. Not only are they high risk for developing psychiatric conditions, mm. uh, there are studies that have actually looked at carotid intimate media. And the worse the marriage is, the greater the thickening. So bad oh marriages goodness. are at risk uh, for heart disease and stroke. So oh multiple goodness. reasons, multiple reasons oh my. <laughs> to engage in couples therapy, yes. either fix if it's fixable or at yes. least ensure uh, uh, a more comfortable parting of ways. Yes. Well, Vlad, I'm going to throw a little curveball here before we end. As I'm thinking about the quality of our relationships, you know, so many people now connect virtually or through social media. And I can't help but wonder if that's not the same as being in person with someone and right. doing things with someone in the real world, if you will. And, you know, the, the data do suggest that any social connection does tend to help, but in person, uh, socializing is more, most effective. Uh, by the way, the study that, uh, that I'm referencing showed that uh, uh, texting does not help. <laughs> well, that's good because I have to tell you a quick story. Uh, a few years ago, I have two... Uh, sons. uh, Several years ago, I walked into my son's bedroom and he's on his computer and looks like he's playing a video game. And I said, well, why don't you go out and play like I used to do? So I'm dating myself, you know, go outside, play with your friends. And he says, dad, I am playing with my friends (laughs) because he was online. So I can't help but think that uh, having in-person relationships is better. But, you know, thank you for bringing up loneliness. Loneliness and early life adversity Uh, clearly are associated with inflammation and with treatment resistance, if you will, or less good response. And um, wow. So, um, Vlad, we're nearing the end of our time together. As always, it has passed so quickly. And I really appreciate you sharing your insights, your knowledge of the data and the research. Are there any final kinds of, of comments or suggestions or tips that you can give for our audience around the topic of residual symptoms specifically? Uh, Andy, you, 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 you have nailed it in the beginning. Uh, uh, the issue is caring uh. and, uh, and, and having a very thoughtful uh, uh, ability to listen yes. and, uh, and spending a little bit more time and getting a, a better understanding of the circumstances enhances rapport and we will hear uh, all kinds of information that otherwise we would not and then carefully sorting out uh, what is adverse reaction what is the residual symptom and uh, uh, what what are some of the paths to address those where uh, we would have uh, greatest degree of degree agreement from our patients right because pushing yes. certain modalities onto them that they don't feel comfortable yes with. Yes. It may not always be productive and definitely will not help yes. with the relationship and, and with treatment adherence. Yes. Well, you know, I have often said to be a good clinician is to be curious. And so asking those questions and listening and caring about the patient. And I'd like to wrap up finally with one of my favorite quotes from Voltaire. 
And in Voltaire's poem, uh, Candide or Optimism, he said a couple of things. One was tend your own garden, which is nice. But what he also said was to uh, generalize is to be a fool, essentially. To particularize is the sole virtue. And so I wish our audience great success in individualizing and personalizing their care as much as they can until we have better, you know, biomarkers of some type and not be afraid to modify your treatments in response and to try to get the best outcomes. Vlad, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Andy. It's always a pleasure uh, to to work with you. And uh, thank you to all of the audience that, that will spend this time with us. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much. And one final thing, for more information on our various educational offerings, podcasts, videos, upcoming live meetings, please go to our website, neiglobal.com. Thanks. Thank you for your participation in this CME NEI podcast episode. To receive your certificate of CME credit, please refer to this podcast's description page for a link to print your certificate. This concludes the CME podcast presentation. For more information about NEI and our premier educational content, please visit neiglobal.com.